was a pleasure to burn, a simple singular thrill, watching the heavy grate sink into the blaze, seeing the dashboards twinkle. Lenka caught it from time to time through her mask, that dizzying chemical spike. Melted plastics and liquefied metals, rubber, fabrics and glass. Sometimes the cage would return with something still inside, an ashy blackened lump, and into the flames it would go once again. The residue of lost, unclaimed, unsellable things. Things that had attained a unique level of unwantedness. Single odd socks and shoes, dirty underwear, unclaimed keys, assorted sex toys and drug paraphernalia. Items deemed so offensive to conventional taste that they were wrapped and sealed before arrival. All of it, caged and dunked, disappearing into the smoky, churning drum of the incinerator. Lenka hadn't always worked in the hotel burn room. For a year or so, she'd worked upstairs in the pink-tinted light of the lost property department. She'd been a sorter, a logger of loss. She labelled items in the hotel computer system, gave them a description, put them in the box ready for storage. If no one claimed their property after 60 days, it was removed. Some items, items of value, would be sent off to auctions, the watches and the jewellery, the silk scarves and the designer bags. The cheaper things were given away to charities and schools. When did those words start sitting comfortably in a sentence together? Anything that couldn't be sold or gifted was sent clattering down an enormous aluminium chute that opened out into the burn room below. Hell, someone had answered when Lenka asked where the chute went. Dark, hot, full of bastards. It wasn't until she went down herself to retrieve her hat, her plum-coloured beanie snatched and sent a chute wood, that she realised what she was missing. It was far and away the most beautiful thing she'd ever seen. There was something of the revelation about it, real lake of fire stuff. She watched through grotty spare goggles as a gaudy plastic candle bra vanished with a hiss, never to grace tasteless table spreads again, and she was hooked. A week later, she was donning the goggles once more, putting her hasty training into practice, pulling her PVC gloves over the exposed parts of her wrists, remembering to close the cage fast, remembering lest the workers of the burn room tease her, to use the term unclaimed property rather than lost. The distinction was important, it seemed. Important in the way that going back for things you've left behind is important. Things that might have, at the time, slipped your mind. But let those upstairs concern themselves with value. Down in the basement, the only game was erasure. Everything that came rattling down that silver chute went into the flames, into the lake of fire. Lenka realised that the stuff in the burn room was, un was as unwanted as it was substantive. It was often more personal than the items that stayed upstairs. Those things could belong to anyone. They were being repurposed, reprieved for continued use. But here, in the stifling burn room of the Royal Battersea Hotel, the items often contained things of their own. There were, for instance, bags upon bags of what hotel management liked to call electronic peripherals. SIM cards for phones, memory cards for cameras, hard drives torn from laptops and computers. The shell of these items were left upstairs, the guts were sent below. Yes, Lenka had let curiosity get the better of her a few times. She'd burnt a few empty packets, took a few things home, but what was unclaimed was unwanted, and what was unwanted, she felt, was free. She started small. A couple of USB sticks and one of those old portable hard drives that you could plug in. She had some fairly clear ideas of what she hoped to find, a sort of snooper's bingo. Mainly what she wanted was evidence. Evidence of an affair, or some kind of human failing, of a crime perhaps. Maybe just a light one, fly tipping locations or something. Light tax evasion. Can it ever be light? Maybe evidence of a secret family kept in regular payments and child support. Evidence of a secret habit. She wondered if the person who had failed to claim their property might be famous, a politician or a celebrity chef. She wondered if she might find content that new newspapers would pay good money for, some salacious or compromising material. She tied back her hair, unzipped her bag in the kitchen, on the kitchen table and took out her phone. Missed call. She didn't need to look to know that it would be Madeline. She put the phone screen side down on the table and reached for the first USB stick. Only now, waiting for the little device to initialise, did she remember the stories of infections, of contamination. 
organizational infrastructure brought down by certain executable programs that lurk within, ready to spread. Vicious malware or viruses that takes weeks to clean. Boring looking files called webdat.dll or tenelec underscore win.exe. She thought of the end that had been set for this piece of plastic and metal. She thought of the tiny circuit board inside melting away in the fire. She wondered how robust these memory sticks were, how much it would need to melt before it was rendered useless. She wondered why, sometimes, these things were called keys. A window with several folders appeared on the screen, one of them intriguingly titled Constants. She began to click through, wishing that she'd had the foresight to pick up some wine on her way back home. There are a few photos of a young woman with auburn hair eating a hot dog in what appeared to be Times Square. There are a few PDF documents about soil erosion and plastic contamination of the seas around the Mediterranean, and there are a few spreadsheets. One of them, Lenka was surprised to find, contained thousands of names and email addresses. She was unsettled. It felt like snooping around someone's kitchen only to find that it opens out into acres of garden. What could she call that? Data within data? A data trove? Oddly, this unsettled her more than the prospect of finding something dark or dangerous. She was almost relieved when, she was almost relieved when the second USB stick contained nothing more but a couple of pirated children's movies and a recipe for pumpkin risotto. The portable hard drive, covered in colourful stickers, Nuclear symbols, red lips, fiery skulls and the like, refused to start. Lenka usually persevered with these things, unplugged and replugged, checked the cables for wear. But she set it aside instead. She'd take it back, along with the USB sticks, and burn them, as she'd been paid to do, as had been originally intended for them. In the weeks that followed, Lenka settled back into her work. She respected the rules to the letter, did as she was told. Everything that came down into the basement went into the flames. Nothing was slipped into that funny pocket inside her bag that you had to look really hard to find. She was a model employee. She still took great pleasure in burning, even taking on some extra shifts at the weekends. But still, she felt a little wince in her heart each time a bag of flash, a bag of flash drives or memory cards tumbled from the chute. On Easter Sunday, on a train rattling west out of the city, she phoned Madeline. They spoke of nothing much for a while. When there was a lull in the conversation, she wanted to tell her she missed her. She wanted to say she forgave her, but she didn't. What she said was this. I found out last week what happens to the ash. It gets sent in big drums to Amsterdam and used for some kind of flood wall. 200 burns in three days, the burn room like a furnace. Burners going up to the surface for gulps of fresh air, all eyes on the chute for the next thing to melt. Lenka was the first to see it arrive. I've got it, she found herself calling above the hum. The largest bag of electronic peripherals they'd had in a while. Lenka wondered if this was how beachcombers felt. She'd have to be quick. The bags were only supposed to be open for a second or two. A cursory check for bulky items. She took her gloves off, against protocol, but it helped with the sifting. At home, she scooped the things she'd taken from the burn room out of the bag. The hall? Six memory cards and four USB drives. All she could gather in a couple of swipes. She remembered the wine this time and went to the kitchen to open it. Sitting back down, glass in hand and giddy with anticipation, she tried a few. Some of them were password protected. One of them was empty. Others held lots of family pictures. Chubby cheeks and ice cream, daybreaks in Margate, little angels terrorising the family dog. She spread the rest out on the table like scattered dominoes and picked out the one that shone. Oily blue-black, like the colour of crow feathers. She inserted the device into her laptop and opened up its contents. Just one file. Lenka felt a little cheated. She'd envisaged something more bountiful. She looked again at the window open on her desktop, at the single file a Word document called, of all things, The Beginner's Guide to Endings. She opened it and scrolled through what appeared to be pages and pages of photographs, some of them crisp and clear, some of them hazy and speckled, some of them looked old, they had that 60s feel, that Polaroid teal and orange. On first glance, some of them seemed to contain very little in the way of subjects or scenery, 
and the quality varied dramatically. Some of them looked like amateur smartphone snaps. Others looked as though they'd been taken from news websites or captured from old newspapers. She scrolled back up to the top of the document and looked at the first image. A black and white photo of a man standing on a train platform, hands in the pockets of a long trench coat, his head slightly bowed. Lenka tried to zoom in on the man's face, but the low-resolution image yielded only snow. She scrolled to the next one. This one was much more vivid. It was a picture of magnified bacteria, a microscope shot. The image seethed with purple and red, each gloopy blob ringed by a bristly black skirt. The type of image that movies, even though you know it's static. The type of image that moves, even though you know it's static. She'd seen something similar many times before, time-lapsed on TV, the blobs wobbling and quivering and touching each other, though they looked like they didn't really want to. She moved to the next image. A smiling man with a widow's peak and a fabric cap, head up and out of a small window dotted with rivets, a single lean hand wailing. It looked like the cockpit of some craft, and beneath him, painted in thick capital letters, were the words, Enola Gay. She opened a browser window and typed the words in, and then sat there for at least an hour reading about the plane, about the bombs, the cities, the destruction. Lenka even read about Mrs. Enola Gay Tibbets herself, she of atomic bomb, Dane plane, name fame. Back to the document, and ignoring her rumbling stomach, Lenka scrolled quickly through the next ones. A forest fire, credits rolling on an old television set, boarded up shops and an abandoned factory, chickens in a battery farm, a conductor bowing on a stage. There was something mollifying about the images. They affected a kind of newsreel stupor in her. Pages and pages of them, on and on. A woman standing with a little girl outside a hospital, the White Cliffs of Dover, a crowd watching a building being demolished, two people sitting in a bar looking in opposite directions. It was well past midnight before Lenka closed the lid of her laptop. She could, ple- she could see blocks of different colours rising when she closed her eyes, like a film reel with scenes spliced and jumbled. She brushed her teeth and crawled into bed, drunk and hungry and happy. The following Saturday, Lenka, took, Lenka stood by the ticket gates with her shoulders in, trying not to get bumped and shunted. She'd never seen the station this busy. When Madeline finally appeared looking flustered, Lenka gave her gave her a wave and a stiff hug and they made their way outside towards the taxis. While they waited in the queue, Lenka shifted the strap of her bag on her shoulder. Her laptop was old and heavy. I've got something to show you, she said to Madeline. Maybe later though, when we reach the city.